thank you for coming to my talk. Um, it's lovely to be on at the, the start of the conference this year because spending an entire conference worrying about your talk is not the way to enjoy it. Um, but here, I'm here today to talk about serverless um, and in particular serverless orchestration. So this is fairly heavily focused on AWS, which is my area of expertise, but the concepts can be applied to whatever variant of cloud provider you choose. So just for a little bit of background on me, uh, I've been building things on AWS for kind of five, six years or so uh, in various capacities, whether in a, a product role, whether it's kind of small startup, enterprise, in the middle. Um, and for me, it's all about sharing and enabling the, the journeys in cloud, so the migration from older or, or legacy tech or tech in different systems to modernizing it into what are the best practices in today's world. Um, you can find me at either of those two there. Always happy to have a chat about pretty much anything. Again, obviously find me at the conference if you want to talk further about any AWS stuff. No strings attached. Um, so today's talk in particular is all about kind of looking at three particular ways of orchestrating serverless systems in AWS. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at these three methods. We're going to build them into an example architecture. Uh, and then at the end, we've got a live demo, which, fingers crossed, should work, um, where I build this architecture and then we'll have a bit, of, a bit of fun with that. So just to get started, I kind of wanted to, to cover off the, the big question for people who might not be familiar with serverless. And a question which I do actually hear from customers sometimes is, does serverless genuinely mean there are no servers? Um, and it's a, a bit of a yes and no question. Serverless is, is a bit magic. Um, it's not real magic, but it, it can feel magic. And the reason why the, the answer to that question around are there servers is, is yes and no, is because to a developer building on serverless, you don't really need to know about the servers. So from, from one perspective, they're, they're not there. But of course, they are, they are really there. Um, nothing runs in, well, in the cloud, so to speak. Um, there are still servers. So it, it feels magical to use. But to me, the, the best definition is it is a, an execution method within cloud computing where developers don't need to worry about managing that, that underlying hardware. And the, the key word there is managing. You can still configure things, you can still tune things, but you haven't got to think about the, the actual server itself. Um, typically, one of the kind of key tenets of, of serverless is all to do with, with how it builds. So you generally don't pay for more than you use. So in some cases, you'll pay per request. Um, some cases you'll pay if you want to provision something for, for a period of time, you might pay for that. But generally, it's if you use nothing, you pay nothing. Which is why I'm <laughs> very pleased when this talk finishes, because at the moment, AWS are eating into my credit card for this live demo. Um, the definition of serverless has, has kind of drifted over the years. When it first came out, it was, was set to a, a relatively small uh, selection of services on AWS and various clouds. And it, it's almost become a little bit of a, a marketing buzzword now. So in the same way that things like AI has been a little bit where a new product is released and then a, a marketing firm come in and slap AI on the end or, or serverless on the end, when it kind of meets some of the requirements, but those core reasons for why something is serverless don't necessarily apply anymore. Uh, an example of this would be uh, at the AWS conference last year, they announced the AWS version of Elasticsearch, which is called OpenSearch. They announced a serverless version of that. Um, technically, you don't have to manage the servers, but one of the core tenets being about paying for how much you use, there's a minimum threshold because you have to have a certain amount of resource. So you have to spend something like $700 a month to use it. 
which doesn't feel like it's the right kind of idea. So if you've used AWS before, um, you will have come across a few services, whether in, in using it or whether in just browsing the console or um, tutorials. These are kind of four services that have probably cropped up somewhere along the way. Uh, I'm not going to kind of describe too much about what each one does now, because we'll go into that a little bit later. But the four services are Lambda Functions, Step Functions, DynamoDB, and EventBridge. And uh, yeah, Step Functions and EventBridge are two we'll look at in the context of uh, orchestration, and the other two we'll pick up on when it comes to building out an example architecture. So the, the first type of orchestration I want to talk about was uh, event-driven architectures. So event-driven architectures are new, they're not, they're not shiny. Uh, it's been something that has existed for a long time, perhaps within a monolithic application. Um, but event-driven architectures in distributed systems, in cloud, has certainly taken off in the last couple of years. Uh, and AWS are putting massive efforts into um, how to enable developers to, take, to make most of this. So in terms of event-driven architectures, the way I like to think of it is components are broadcasting or announcing things that have happened. Um, the other parts of the system that find out about these things that happened don't need to know how it's happened or, or why it's happened. All they need to know is it has happened and I need to do something about it or I don't need to do something about it. So this is a, a, a classic example of a very uncoupled system or decoupled system. Uh, perfect for those asynchronous workloads where you want to say, something's happened, go and do something with it, but I don't really care if you finish it or not, but I need you to know it's happened. The kind of example I thought up yesterday for a relatable example of this is if I stood on this stage now and shouted the word fire very, very loud, there's lots of different people in this venue that react very, very differently. So you might have the Nordev staff might look up and not invite me back next year. Um, the venue staff would start following their uh, fire procedures, but no one really knows why I've shouted fire or what's led me to come to that decision. All they know is that I've broadcasted that event that there is a fire. Um, I'm not going to show fire um, because I do want to come back next year. But that is kind of the most human example I can think of in this scenario. So there's, there's two pieces of terminology there, which is event producers and event consumers. So producers being the things that broadcast and announce and the consumers being the things that listen and react to those events. And within AWS, there is one kind of key service for events, and that is EventBridge. So EventBridge is a serverless service. You don't have to think about what service EventBridge runs on, um, fully managed. And EventBridge allows event producers to emit events and broadcast as events and then allows rules to be set up to say, when this event occurs in my system, go and do something. Um, all the AWS services will be broadcasting events all the time. You haven't got to do anything with them, um, but you know they're there. So you know that, for example, uh, the storage service in AWS, um, Amazon S3, when a new object is uploaded to a storage bucket, an event is emitted to say, an object has been created. You might not care about that, so you haven't got to create a rule to handle it, but if you want to do something with it, you can. So again, this is very much designed around asynchronous workloads, those things where something needs to happen, but it doesn't really matter in what order. Um, you haven't got to worry about things like race conditions. It is just a do something. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you handle it, because I've told you it's not a problem anymore. Um, EventBridge is quite flexible. Um, it can handle things like schedules as well. So event-driven architectures and events in general don't necessarily have to mean an event has occurred somewhere in a system. It could be um, the time is this, so I need to do this. So EventBridge can handle all of that for you.
So I wanted to, to look at the kind of anatomy of, of what an AWS event might look like. So AWS events can be completely custom when they're passed through EventBridge, or like I say, they can come from AWS services as well. So the, in this JSON object, there's three top level keys, and those three keys are the only things that are required. So you have detail type, which is the name of the event, and normally the name of an event would follow some form of convention. Um, I typically tend to try and go for a concatenation of a noun and an adjective. So in this case, conference talk started, um, fire shouted, whatever you want to, to go for. And that tends to give a good description of what's happened to what particular thing. Um, so I say these are just the required fields. You can add more if you want to, um, and that's not a problem but you have to have something in, in all of these. In the source, you, again, can kind of put what you want, but Amazon tend to recommend following the, the Java style of um, namespacing things. And then in detail, again, it's a completely free form field. Put what you want in there. Um, the one thing I would say with events is it's really hard to keep things backwards compatible uh, unless you are either versioning or being very flexible with your schemas in the first place. So um, you know that if one part of a system is using an event and is expecting it a particular format and a particular field, then the producer of that event needs to carry on sending that. So having some form of registry to, to make sure that you know what's being used and where is really important. So an example of, of how events can uh, be used in AWS, this is, is what you could do. So you could have a, a Lambda function. So Lambda functions run kind of typically small units of code. Um, they are designed for, well, were designed originally for running those small pieces of code. That could produce an event. So this, this piece of code we're running could say, I want to emit an event because I've created a user. Um, uh, a, at the start of a system, you might decide, actually, we don't need to do anything else. We've, we've created the user. That's kind of it. But if we imagine we've got this distributed system, a, a kind of microservices architecture, and we've got a microservice to handle users, and then maybe you've got a different microservice to handle marketing, for example. So let's say our Lambda function emits an event to say a user has been created. Um, our marketing microservice might want to uh, consume that event, say, okay, when a user is created, let's add them to newsletter, or let's check the event, see if they've opted in, and if they have opted in, then let's add them to newsletter. So you can do that kind of thing. Um, this is probably a very simplistic example. You can have kind of as many consumers as you want to an event within, within reason, uh, and it isn't just Lambda functions that can produce and consume events. Um, the opportunities really are endless. So the second um, of those pieces of, kind of orchestration tooling I want to talk about was queues. So as a, a kind of true Brit, um, we all love a good queue. And experience queues every day in your life. So you queue for lunch, you queue in traffic, um, supermarkets everywhere. And they, they all have the same purpose, really. It's to stop something downstream from becoming too overloaded. So we know that you sat at traffic lights because you don't want to have too many cars in junction at the same time. You sit waiting to buy concert tickets on a website because Ticketmaster can't build websites. Um, and you queue for lunch because you don't want to um, turn the tables over. And it's the same concept in cloud. So Amazon SQS is, is probably, it's either the oldest or the second oldest service. So going back uh, 2005, 2006 now, um, for the, the very origins of, of what AWS was. And it's kind of the core of so many serverless systems because the concept is so simple. It is just a, a queue. You can put messages in and 
pull from the queue. But it's, it's such a valuable thing to have because if you know that you've got a resource downstream that cannot handle lots of connections, you can buffer them. You can make sure that it's only pulling one off the queue at a time. Um, lots you can do with that. Again, really good for those asynchronous workloads where you want to put something on the queue, you know it will get done at some point, um, but it's not urgent, it's not something you need to, to kind of do that synchronous request response type model for. And with queues on AWS, there's two types. Um, you have standard queues, um, and you have first in, first out queues. So standard queues guarantee you uh, at least once delivery of a message to whatever is consuming your queue. So in theory, it means you, you could receive the same message twice. Um, and this kind of links back to the, the keynote, really, when we're talking about um, this idea of kind of consistency and the, the cap theorem, and actually you can't have everything. Um, you can't have all the performance, you can't have the consistency. Uh, there's got to be a sacrifice somewhere. So for AWS, it's the, the standard queue is cheaper, um, but you know that it's gonna, you need to do something to handle those potential duplicates and you lose some control. The, the first in, first out queues or the FIFO queues are kind of what they say on the tin. So they guarantee the order of the messages. So you know that when you put a message on the queue, that will be the first message that comes off when they consume it. And that does guarantee one message for their delivery. Um, within SQS, you also have um, support for dead letter queues. You can do things like, uh, if you've got a Lambda function, for example, that's consuming from your queue, you can say, if my Lambda function can't process this message successfully, send it back to the queue. Um, and you can do some configuration around that. So you can do things like saying, um, send it back to the queue, but on the third time I receive it, send it to a dead letter queue to be processed a different way or to alert somebody that there's something that hasn't really worked. And that's kind of built in. There's things like um, built in dead letter queue redriving as part of that service as well. So you can kind of click a button and it will automatically redrive all of those failed messages into your main queue. Um, very, very powerful service. It's not something that AWS have kind of created in 2006 and abandoned. It's, it's still very much at the forefront of what they do. Within that customization, you also have things like um, the ability to do message delays. So you could say, if you know that, for example, um, something processes in a system over here, we put a message on the queue, but we shouldn't process it for five minutes because something else needs to happen first, or um, yeah, maybe there needs to be delayed for another reason. You can do that. Um, you can also do things like retention periods. So you can say, uh, if you, if the queue kind of gets too backed up, only hold on to things that are an hour old. Duplicate your messages. So you can say, actually, if if your application putting into the queue is a bit flaky um, and sends something twice, you can deduplicate based on an ID, so some form of um, item potency in there. But you can also deduplicate based on content of that message as well which is quite clever. So again, really simple example of how in isolation this might work. So let's say we've got our queue full of messages. Um, in AWS, you would set up a, a Lambda function or again, something else. Um, Lambda is probably the easiest to work with in terms of pulling from a queue. Uh, you can map uh, what Amazon call a uh, event source mapping between the queue and the function. And what that event source mapping allows you to do is behind the scenes, they are standing up uh, completely invisible to you, a set of processing instances and polling instances. So all they're doing is all the time they're polling the queue to say, are there new messages? And then when there is a new message, it transparently brings it through to your Lambda function. Your Lambda function gets uh, invoked and you pay for whatever the cost of that invocation is. Um, as part of that event source mapping between the two, you can also do things like configure um, how many messages to pull off the queue. 
So if you, for example, are doing a lot of processing in your Lambda function, and you know that you can't process more than one message at a time, whether it's because of time limits, whether it's resource, uh, you can say only pull one message at a time per invocation, and then start a fresh one. So very, very flexible in that respect. And then the final one is um, state machines. So state machines, uh, I find the best way to think of them is kind of flow charts in the cloud. So orchestration in the sense of state machines is very much a case of uh, a kind of linear workflow. It's saying do this, then this, then this. Um, you can add things like conditionals in there. So you can say if the result of this particular state matches this, go down this branch. Um, if not, down this branch. Um, uh, state machines in AWS, you can also do things like um, mapping over things. So you can say, I've got this list of uh, files, list of keys, whatever it needs to be. Um, do something for each one of those. There's some real flexibility that step functions gives you. So this is typically yeah, most typically used in synchronous tasks where you need to say, do this, then this, and then this. Um, it technically is possible to add asynchronicity into those workflows, but the most common use case is when you've got dependent steps and you want to orchestrate everything in kind of one place. Um, you can use it to, to orchestrate lots of things from across a distributed system into one. Um, or you can use it as a single system by itself. So you could say um, your microservice could be handling uh, an order that's being created. So your, your state machine could say uh, check stock. If there is no stock, then after you don't process the order. If there is stock, then go down this path, do billing, everything you would expect. But it allows you to do all of those without having to call out to different areas. Um, and in some cases, that's what you need. And with state machines on AWS uh, and step functions in particular, um, again, two types of step function. So there's the express step functions and standard step functions. So express step functions are, I think they're limited to five minutes in terms of how long they can execute for. Um, and with that five minute execution, it means they are designed for very, very high throughput, very, very high concurrency. So this is where you could perhaps link up to an API. So you could say, rather than having a piece of application code that handles your API response, your step function is the thing that's responding to your API. Um, obviously, you don't want to wait five minutes for a, an API response, but if it's a, a shorter workflow, then you could quite easily do that. There's lots of ways to integrate with them. You can file them off synchronously, file them off asynchronously. Um, but again, very, very flexible way of orchestrating lots of different components in a synchronous manner. Um, always really hard to say synchronous after A. Um, but this, again, is an example of, of what you could do with step functions. You could say, let's do this regardless. Let's start this step function. Then let's have some form of decision. Let's see what the result is from that first Lambda function. And then if result is yes, go down this path. If result is no, go down this path. And then converge at the end. And very, very simplistic workflow, but you can scale this massively. So you can say that there is, there is a limit in terms of how many states you can have, but it's in the kind of thousands. So um, if you get to that point, you probably should be splitting things up anyway. So I wanted to take kind of this theory and now actually look at how you can put this into an application itself. So what I want to kind of walk through the architecture of is um, an audience participation application. <laughs> and this is where my live demo gets nervous. Um, so the idea will be is that Audience members can choose a shape and a color on their phone, laptop, tablet, whatever it needs to be. This is stored in a database. Um, and then on my laptop, on my screen, and you will see it up there, the choices that audience members have made 
will up on the screen in JSON form because I've run out of time to make it pretty. Um, so, yeah, let's go. Um, the one thing I kind of thought with this is kind of linking back to that idea of, of serverless being magic. And as I was writing this, I thought, magicians, when they do things on stage, have this kind of one glamorous assistant that does all the trickery for them. Um, I probably set myself up for failure by choosing a room of highly unpredictable and very technical assistants um, with a reputation for breaking things. But let's go for it anyway. So when we're designing this, I want to kind of self-impose a, a technical constraint on us. Um, but the reason it's, it's self-imposed rather than actually imposed is because in, in an audience of this size, it's not going to bring down a database. Um, that isn't a challenge, by the way. Um, but we need something to, to give us the reason for using a cube. So the way we're going to start is we are going to have two API gateways. Somewhere we haven't talked about API gateway, um, but at a kind of high level, API gateway is a service that, again, serverless service, that allows you to direct your requests coming into AWS to a particular service. So you can say, um, if something is this path, go to this Lambda function. If it's this path, go to a queue. This path, go to a step function. Um, much like you would normally define an API in your um, Express roots file or Laravel roots file or whatever your flavor. Um, for the audience, it will be a React web app. Um, I will add at this point, I am not by any stretch a front-end developer. Um, the code will be on GitHub afterwards, but please be nice. Um, for the audience, it's a, um, it's a synchronous response, so very much request response, um, just a, a REST API type thing. So you'll get an immediate notification to say your message has been sent. Um, at that point, it hasn't been processed. You just got acknowledgement to say it has entered the system. Um, for me, um, it's done by WebSockets. So I will connect to the WebSocket API. Um, WebSockets being bi-directional. So with that WebSocket API, I will then see messages come back onto my laptop once all the magic has been performed. So let's start off by looking at what happens on the audience side of things. So we're making use of an API gateway feature where you can directly integrate with an AWS resource. So sometimes you would have uh, some application code in there to kind of proxy it through for you. So you might say, request comes in, goes to the Lambda function, do something to it, and then make another call to something like our SQSQ. Um, but in this case, we can go directly um, because the, the format of the request is, is something that we are, are fairly confident nobody's going to mess with. Um, the reason we're putting on the queue here is because the database that we're using downstream in our system, um, that we'll come onto in a couple of slides, is the, the smallest RDS database, um, Amazon's relational database service database that I could find um, because this has been running, working, not running, uh, for a week, and I didn't want my cards to get hit too hard. So we're using a queue here to control that concurrency downstream. So what we're doing is, with this queue, we are uh, using a new service that came out, again, uh, in November last year, at AWS conference called Event Bridge Pipes, um, which isn't shown on the screen, but it's kind of in between SQS and step functions. So Event Bridge Pipes is essentially a way for two different AWS services that um, shouldn't really work together to, to join them together. So you can say, I think, or think of it like a pipe. So you pull the queue, messages come through the pipe, and they go onto the um, step functions at the end. Uh, event bridge pipes does also give you some things like uh, allowing you to filter and enrich those messages. So if you've got a message coming in and there's not enough information in that, you can call 
a Lambda function as part of that pipe, and you can add data to that message before it gets to its destination at the end, um, which I do have a blog post on, showing this bug. Um, so we know with this that because it's coming from a queue, we can control that concurrency. We can say, let's just keep it nice and simple. Let's have one message coming off the queue at a time. So when it's going to the step function and we're inserting into our database, we're only doing it kind of one transaction, one message at a time, and our little database isn't going to get overloaded. So this is now inside of our step functions workflow. So very, very simple workflow. All we've really got is two states in our workflow. So we've got a Lambda function, which is connecting to our database and writing the contents of that request uh, into our database. Um, three columns in our database, we've just got uh, shape, color, and a user ID. Um, I would show you the database, but my proxy isn't working. Um, and our second state is we're going to emit an event. So at this point, once this event is emitted, until the second half of the system is built, it does nothing. Um, this event is purely saying, we've processed some participation from the audience. Um, that's it. Uh, the contents of the event do contain the shape, the color, and the user ID. So we, we can do something with it. But right at this moment, it's fired off into our event reach, event bus, and that, that's it. So as we move on to the, the kind of the second half of the, the application itself. So for WebSockets to work, um, there's a fairly major limitation in API Gateway uh, with WebSockets, which is it doesn't have a way to broadcast to all connected clients, like just out of the box. You have to maintain that list yourself, um, which I didn't realize until I tried to do it and got very, very confused. So what we're actually doing is when I make a connection to my WebSocket API, we've got, uh, there's two routes in a WebSocket API that come by default, which are a connect route and the disconnect route, which allow you to perform certain actions when someone connects and when a client disconnects. And remember, this is now from my laptop um, to AWS rather than from um, your phone to AWS. So what we're doing in this case is we've got a Lambda function, which is going to be um, handling that connect and disconnect action. And what we're doing is we are writing something into DynamoDB. Um, so DynamoDB is, I guess, another serverless uh, service in AWS. Uh, it's a NoSQL database, so key value, very similar to kind of MongoDB um, and those type of databases. Um, very, very cheap, very, very fast, um, perfect for this kind of use case where we're restoring just um, well, a single value, which is, this is my client ID that I've connected to WebSocket with. So we're storing that in there. Um, if I disconnect from WebSocket, it will remove my ID from the table using that Lambda function as well. And that is some custom application code that you do have to write. So this is then what happens when the event gets emitted from that slide a couple slides ago, uh, at the end of our step function. So we've got something set up, uh, one of the event bridge rules set up to say, when this audience participation process event is raised, I want you to trigger a Lambda function. So when this Lambda function is triggered, we can then retrieve from our DynamoDB table the list of clients that are connected to WebSocket, which should just be one, unless anybody's very quick and writes down the URL that I may or may not have put an API key on. Um, and then sends a message to every client that's connected to the WebSocket with the contents of that event that has just been processed. So that's kind of what it looks like. I'm aware it's going to be very, very small on these little screens. Um, the lines don't obviously mean it's synchronous or linear or anything in, in that respect. It's more just to show a the kind of logical flow of where things go. Um, I don't know if, can I, no. Oh, no, I can. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So as we make a request through the React app on your phones. Um, that wasn't meant to fail. Um, as we make the request through the React app on our phones, it goes through this top path here. Um, goes to the API gateway, message goes on our queue. We then um, go through event bridge pipes to trigger our step function. In that step function, we are uh, triggering a Lambda function. That Lambda function is writing to our RDS instance, so our database. At the end of that step function, we're firing the audience participation process event. At that point, the kind of that stream has completed. Nothing else has to happen. Um, we've chosen to take something else. So we've chosen to, to build something on the bottom half of this diagram, which is to say, when that event is raised, let's trigger a Lambda function to get those connection IDs from DynamoDB that we've populated when the WebSocket is being connected to and send them back to um, all of our clients. So just before we get to the uh, live demo, are we now 36 minutes? Cool. Um, just before we get back to our live demo, um, kind of wanted to round up on the three key services which I used for the, the service orchestration on AWS. So SQS for controlling throughput of messages through a system, step functions for those multi-step processes where it's nine times out of 10 synchronous and linear, uh, and event bridge for our event-driven or scheduled architectures. Um, one thing with event bridge actually that I've just forgotten was uh, up until October last year, uh, event bridge always operated on the scheduled calls in UTC only, um, which I mean, I'm sure everyone's had some form of disaster with time zones. Um, event bridge does now support time zones in schedules, so you can say, run me this thing in AWS at 8 a.m. London time every week, every Monday, um, which feels like it should have been kind of a day one thing, but hey, it's Amazon. Um, yes, yeah, so just before we get to the, the actual demo itself, um, put a couple of resources up there. Uh, what I'll do is I will get the slides on GitHub as well, so don't worry too much about taking photos and stuff now. Um, the Twitter handle on the top um, is a guy called David Boy. Uh, he is a developer advocate at AWS in the serverless team. Uh, really, really nice guy, uh, focused on event-driven architectures. So if that's an area that interests you, give him a follow because he is brilliant. Um, the second one is, again, produced by the AWS serverless developer advocate team. They've published uh, loads and loads of kind of serverless patterns of how you can do various things with all the different serverless uh, features of AWS. Uh, they include the infrastructure as code with kind of cloud formation and, and SAM as well. A uh, really, really valuable resource. And then again, shameless plug, because I do write things from time to time, and hopefully somebody might find them useful. So um, we have a live demo. I have stickers, because if it doesn't work, I can bribe you all. Um, I don't have enough stickers, so it will be first come, first served. Uh, but if you could go to this website, and I now need to figure out how to show this and show something else at the same time. And then what I can do is, you will then hopefully see at the top of your screens, you'll have your user ID. And then you will see somewhere on the screen, your user ID, your color, and your shape coming through. These aren't fakes, these are actually real. So hopefully someone spots those to, to uh, ensure that I'm not lying here. And, and that is that. I hope it's been useful for some of you. Um, if you do want a sticker, please do come and grab one because I did actually have to pay for them. Um, uh, 
But yeah, I hope you found it useful and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.